But several weeks ago, actually beginning Thanksgiving Sunday, we began a series of messages on joy, and, and we've interrupted that series. We'd had Pastor Warren share uh, a few weeks back, and then last week was, was Christmas. But I really did feel impressed, actually, um, earlier in the fall, that we should take some time and talk about joy. Because as we've seen in our most recent text from John chapter 15, the will of God for us is that our joy may be complete or our joy may be full. And the beautiful thing about the joy that comes from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ is that it's independent of our circumstance. This past year, one testimony we all should have had, let me put this down, there we go. One testimony we all should have had is that we lived and we finished this year with joy and we expect 2021 to be a year of joy, not because of our circumstances, because for many of us, the circumstances of 2020 were bleak. We faced the virus, we faced the election, we faced the, the civil unrest, we all faced personal tragedies and the regular issues of life. There were a lot of reasons to get down in the dumps. But if you know Jesus, and, and, and not only if you know Jesus, but if you're walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, your heart and your life should be full of joy. Because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, the kingdom of God isn't eating or drinking or things of this world. But the kingdom of God, rather, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So being connected with Jesus and being filled with the new wine of God's Holy Spirit, and I guess they tell me, I'm not a, a wine person, but they tell me new wine in the Bible is a wine that had a kick to it. <laughs> and it brings you a little joy and cheer. And those who were filled with the Holy Spirit were, they, they were accused of being people who were filled with that new wine. And the reason for that is because they were joyful. Even though everything in the world had been the same, and in fact, for them it was worse because Jesus no longer was with them, they were joyful. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit rested upon them in a mighty way. And so it is our privilege, because of what Jesus did, chastisement of our peace was upon him, we can be joyful. He was wounded and bruised for our transgressions and for our iniquities, so we're forgiven and free from guilt. And because the Holy Spirit is flowing through us, we can be joyful. Even though life and the circumstances of life might be less than. But in addition to that, we need to be joyful. One, I think, because it pleases our Heavenly Father, but two, and that being very, very important. But two, people need to see within us something that they don't have. They need to see the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. You know, they can, and unfortunately this year, and one of the, one of the things that's really, uh, you know, uh, really um, shaken, has been shaken this year is the church. Not, not, as our sister shared, you know, God's hand is upon the church, but God has been shaken the church and we've been caught up in a lot of things but a lot of things within the church have been and are being exposed God is getting rid of the garbage but the world needs to see the true church and not just a church that is 
righteous and pious, and I'm not saying anything bad about, about piety, you know, about living holy before God, living lives devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is very important. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is also to, to be a church that is brimming with joy. People need to see that because people need that. And it'll be, it'll be something that the Holy Spirit will use to draw them to you. And so let us read our, our text together this morning as, as we continue to talk about joy. We, we talked about how not only that joy comes through the Holy Spirit, but there are things that we need to live out in our lives if, if we're going to live in joy. One of them we talked about on, uh, on uh, Thanksgiving Sunday, that being a people of, of praise and worship God inhabits uh, the praises of his people. Of course, knowing Jesus grants us joy because, as I mentioned, our sins are forgiven. But what we've been talking about most recently is, is we live in joy when our lives are fruitful. And what I mean by that, when our lives are, are producing things for God's kingdom, and we'll talk, we'll remind ourselves specifically what we've been talking about. It is something that, that adds to or, or enables us to, to live powerfully in the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. But let's read our text together this morning. John 15, beginning with verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Let's bow our hearts together and let's ask God's blessing to be with us as we look to God's word this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your power and your presence here. Thank you for your holy word. God, as you wrote to, or as you spoke to the disciples many years ago, clean us by your word, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Speak to our hearts today. Lord, as we talk about the importance of being connected in order to be fruitful, uh, we pray that you will allow these words to speak to our soul, to help us, Lord, to become more anchored in our faith and more fruitful in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Prior to this, we talked about some of the reasons why there is joy when we are fruitful uh, in addition to fulfilling our call, in addition to fulfilling our calling, pleasing God. And when we live in God's power and God's grace, you know, joy just flows from us. There is a feeling of accomplishment when we are fruitful. Fruitfulness being described as this. Number one, fruit reproduces. And so when we are actively engaging in spreading the word of God to people who don't know Christ and... Fruit isn't just sowing the seed. Fruit is also caring for the young plant that shoots forth from the seed. When we take time and disciple people in a godly way from the word of God. And we, we see people come to Christ. And we see people grow in Christ. There's, an, a, sense of, there's a sense of accomplishment in that. And I don't know about you, but... Accomplishment in my life 
brings me great joy. You know, you know what really makes... You know what really gives me joy is when I have a project at home, something breaks, and I have no idea how to fix it. And, and because I'm, I'm cheap, <laughs> I won't say it's because I'm Scottish, even though I do, my, on my grandmother's side, there's Scots-Irish, I guess. Frugal, frugal, thank you, sister. And, um, and now, you know, I found, you know, YouTube and, and you, know, you could probably build a house. And I go on there and I look and I get the pieces and parts and tools and I take things apart, I put it back together and it works. What a feeling of accomplishment. That I've done something that beforehand I had no idea how to do. I really, I really feel good about myself. <laughs> A real plumber or, or electrician would look at me and say, you got to be kidding, man. <laughs> but how much more so when we're used by God to do the impossible in someone's life, bringing them to Jesus or, or being used by God for, in God working some kind of spiritual breakthrough or spiritual growth in their lives. How wonderful it is. And isn't it great as well to know that if you know Jesus, your life not only has a purpose, it has an eternal purpose. That the things you are doing in your life for the kingdom of God won't just last for a time, they'll last forever. You know, the achievement, you, you could build a house. And that house could live, could last for hundreds of years, but eventually that house is going to fall down. But if you're involved with God's kingdom and you allow the Holy Spirit to work through you, the, the walls of the kingdom that you're building, that will last forever and that will carry throughout eternity, bringing glory and honor to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And isn't that great joy to know that your life is about not just something that is meaningful, something that is eternal. We talked about how, how God cares for us and, 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 and but how the only way we can accomplish this is by staying connected to the vine. We're, we are not inanimate objects. We're not tools that God is using to, inanimate tools to, to build his kingdom like a hammer or, or a saw or a drill. We are living vines connected to Jesus that not only have life, but that the Heavenly Father is concerned with and cares for. You are more than just a tool. God just doesn't want to use you. God wants to continue to breathe life into you. In Jesus' name. But there are some disturbing, and I don't mean that in a bad sense, there are some disturbing and, and challenging things in this portion of Scripture that I think it's important that we take time to talk about. Once again, verses 1 and 2 of our text, John 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. One of the aspects of the caring ministry of the Heavenly Father is not only making sure that w there's plenty of water, and when I think of water, the symbol of water in Scripture is often the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Not only does God refresh us, as far as ministering to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only does, does a gardener fertilize, you know, if, if you want 
if you want a good garden, you just don't throw it in some some uh, some dirt and let Mother Nature take over. You you make sure that that earth has plenty of nutrients, and Jesus brings that out as far as the parable, one of the parables of the fig tree. So he nourishes, and of course we're nourished through, through the word. But the two things mentioned here that God does that is unpleasant, one to a lesser degree, but one to a, a very grave degree, is the cultivating process, where he just doesn't let us kind of grow wild and do our own thing, but he deals with us in such a way as to maximize fruitfulness in our lives and to make sure there is nothing in our lives that will hinder the, the manufacture of fruit, the the winning, the building of other people, and, and oh, I almost forgot the other aspect of fruitfulness, becoming more like him. Developing Christian character is laid out for us in Galatians chapter 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Against such there's no law. One way he does that is through pruning. And next Sunday, first Sunday of the year, we're going to talk about the process of, tr of pruning. But the second thing, the first thing he mentioned is, is more disturbing. That being this, um, the cutting off of every branch that does not bear fruit. And then once again, verse 6, to emphasize this point. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. What is Jesus saying here? What is Jesus getting? I'm not saying trying because I think the image or the illustration that he's making is quite clear. That being this, it is possible, if not probable, that if you do not maintain a strong connection with the true vine, Jesus Christ, you will come to a place where you will fall away from knowing, loving, and believing in Jesus. A, a term that we that we um, that some branches that once had life would be cast away, and a term we often use uh, to describe this is, is the term backsliding. And so, the, so the question I have this morning, in addition to what does this mean, is can people backslide, or do people walk away from faith? in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the reason why I'm going to take time and talk about this this morning is, is there are a lot of people, a lot of teachers, wonderful teachers who teach really good things. Bright books on television. Many of you know them, many of you listen to them. And I'm not saying you shouldn't. But they will emphatically say, no, it is not possible for someone to fall away from serving Jesus or backslide. And, you know, I appreciate the fact that they have an opinion. But if we're being honest, we can't go by what someone thinks the Word of God says. We have to go by what the Word of God actually says about maintaining a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, my friend, it is not just important to make a decision to serve Jesus. We love decisions, and we should. You know, a person comes to the altar, or you know, a person's in a, a, at our, 
you know, some kind of a, a rally, like a Billy Graham crusade or a youth camp or, or a revival service. And, and they call out to Jesus and ask Jesus to come into their lives and forgive them of their sins. That's wonderful. That's, that's an, a critically important first step. But that faith that you declare that day that you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, in order for you to make it to heaven's shores, you've got to keep that for the rest of your life because the Bible says, he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And this is brought out in this scripture as well as many other scriptures that it is possible for those who know Jesus to fall away from the faith. Let me give you another illustration that Jesus gives us from Matthew chapter 13. And it, it's the story or the illustration of the sower and the seed or the planter in the seed. And how the story goes is, I don't know what kind of farmer he was, I don't know if that's the way they farmed back in those days. I didn't get that much into the study. But this guy goes out with a bag of seed and he's just throwing it everywhere. Anywhere and everywhere. He's just throwing seed everywhere. And, and some of it falls on, on the, the path that he's walking on. Some goes in the thorns. Some goes on, on kind of a rocky area. It must have been in New England. And then... Um, um, <laughs> I can tell when there are not many people here. <laughs> and then uh, uh, some fell on good earth and, and that of course produced. And, and, and this is the, the uh, interpretation of this illustration by Jesus to his disciples beginning in verse 18 of Matthew 13. Listen then to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one sown with seed beside the road. The one sown with seed on the rocky places. This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself. But it is only temporary, and when the affliction or persecution occurs because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one sown with seed among the thorns, this is one who hears the word, and the anxiety of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So, four, three different types of earth are sown and uh, two deal, one deals with um, Satan coming in and taking it away because you know the heart is hard and it doesn't perceive, doesn't allow the Holy Spirit to open up its mind to what the Spirit of God has to say. One goes among the thorns and it, it does grow up. This talks about the joyless Christian. It's, it's not the, the, the thrust of my message today, but I do want to take a moment and talk about it. The, the seeds sown in the thorns, it does bear up, but because it's, it's in the thorns, which are the distractions of this world, either riches or cares or different things, it chokes it out. And, and if we're reading this scripture as it's presented, it means their lives will never become fruitful. And therefore, their lives will never become joyful. I, I, I think, and maybe I should have taken a week just to talk about this verse. I think there are a lot of Christians who are allowing riches, pleasures, cares, sorrows, and woes to overflow, overflow their mind, to captivate their attention, to keep them from being, keep them from keeping their eyes on Jesus to keep them from being fruitful and therefore they're joyless. And the reason I say that is not because I know what's going on in their minds. I can see the lack of joy upon their, not just their face, their entire countenance. They're joyless if not lifeless Christians. That's, that's just a freebie I threw in there. That's not our message today. But we are talking about the one who is on the rocky 
soil. And this isn't the only place this scripture and John 15, you know, two illustrations. In fact, the Apostle Paul said that God expressly, clearly told him that true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ would walk away from the faith. And let me, let me just say something about that. Those friends of ours who believe in the eternal security, the security of the believer, some call it once saved, always saved, their response to people like me who don't believe that particular doctrine is, you can't lose your salvation. Well, I agree with that. You can't lose your salvation. You're not going to wake up one morning and say, Oh, I'm no longer saved. What happened? But Scripture certainly teaches you can walk away from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus talks about it. It happened in Bible times. It's happening today. And it will happen until Jesus Christ comes again. And we need to be careful for ourselves. And we need to warn especially new believers, but all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we all have the potential of walking away from the Lord if we're not careful. Listen to what Paul says. And, and he, he just doesn't say, well, I just kind of feel impressed. You ever share anything on your heart that you feel kind of impressed with? I do all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. Keep doing that. But notice concerning this, this concept or this, this reality of, of people falling away. The Spirit expressly says, 1 Timothy 4.1, or explicit, explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith. They once knew Jesus and they're going to walk away. Paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of, teachings of demons. The Holy Spirit, whether it was an audible voice or just the clear voice of the Spirit of God to His Spirit, told Him, at the end of time, people are going to walk away. It can happen. In fact, 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul talks about how, how people will reject sound teaching because there's things about this book that they don't like or they don't agree with, so they're going to seek after teachers with their itching ears, people who will tickle their ears, and what he means by that, people who will say things that they like, whether it lines up with the Word of God or not. And the end result of, of people who begin, and, and there are a lot of churches in, in the world and, and churches in, in um, our culture today that were once truly born again, that once believed in the full counsel of God, but who have now been, been given over to false teachers that have nothing to do with the gospel of, of repentance. And so have led people astray. And people at that time ha had walked away, including a, an individual who worked very, very closely with the Lord Jesus, with, with the Apostle Paul, excuse me, that being a man named Jesus. And it's happening today. Countless number of people. Some, some people... They, they get saved, they come to know Jesus, and they stay with it for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and then they fall away. But there have been instances where people have known Jesus for many, many years, been used by God, and they've walked away. Some walked away and they didn't know anything about the Word of God, but there have been others who've had degrees in the Bible. And, and not just, you know, I have my bachelor's. Not, not just a bachelor's degree. They, they, they've got the PhD in, in, or, in uh, or 
whatever it is, I didn't go that high in my Bible training, but you know, doctrine and biblical studies or whatnot, no longer serving Jesus. There have been people who have been pastors and, and missionaries. People who have served God faithfully. They may not have had a title within the church, but have been just as important to the ministry of the church as well as casual attendees who just kind of show up. Who once truly knew the Lord and who have walked away from the faith. And no longer have that assurance of salvation in their in their lives and and they're bound to an eternity of outer darkness of hellfire and brimstone which leads us to the next question which is this what does it actually mean to fall away now there is no I'm going to be careful how I say this. No magic bullet as far as doing any one thing or saying any one thing. We get so caught up in our, our works. Am I doing the right thing? And, you know, if I do something, say something, think something wrong, all of a sudden a, a lightning bolt is going to come down and strike me and I'll be condemned to hell forever. That's not how it works. Person walks away from the Lord when they walk away from their faith. Once, once again, 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit express, explicitly says in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith. That word also could be translated depart or walk away. And the idea behind that word is to make a conscience, conscious decision to no longer follow after what you've been following or stay where you've been staying to walk away from it. People making the decision to walk away from faith in Jesus. And a person does that when they take their faith in God and place it in something else. This is something that Romans chapter 1 talks about and it's an affliction that has afflicted mankind from the very beginning. Regarding those who are condemned, Romans 1.25 says they exchanged the truth of God for falsehood or truth, the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature or creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So the way a person walks away from the Lord or walks away from their salvation is to exchange their faith in Jesus and begin to believe in something else. It could be in the power of money. It could be some other religion. I'm going to believe in, in I'm going to believe in Buddha now. Or I'm going to believe in I'm going to follow Islam or I'm going to follow Taoism or Hinduism or some other kind of ism that's out there. Or I'm going to trust myself. I'm, you know, this is the prevailing theme or ideology of our society. Everything you need is within you. No, it's not. If it was, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die for you. Even no faith at all is a faith in something. You know, people say atheists have no religion. They absolutely do have a religion. It's a faith in no God. It's exchanging the truth of Jesus Christ for the lie that you can somehow get by, you can somehow have worth and meaning to your life, and most importantly, you can have and assurance in the life and the kingdom that is to come through anything else other than Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And there are several reasons why people come committed believers, 
spirit-filled ministers, as well as casual attendees, why they walk away from God, why they exchange a truth for the lie. And very simply put, according to our text, they break fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They no longer remain connected to Him. Let me share with you very quickly, and I covered my little clock with a mask, so I have no idea what time it is. <laughs> It's like I could press a button. And I still don't know what time it is. That's all right. Oh, okay. We did start a little later. Four things that break the connection. Number one, sin. Old Testament, Ezekiel 18.4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. Nothing will break your connection with the Lord Jesus Christ faster than sin. Well, Pastor Randy, that's an Old Testament. Well, the New Testament says this in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Now, I'm not saying if you stub your toe and curse and then walk out and get hit by a truck that you're going to immediately be cast down to hell. I'm saved by grace through faith. Amen. But what Scripture does teach us regarding sin, if we consistently persist in a non-repented fashion, a lifestyle of sin, if God is convicting us of something we're doing and we refuse to repent from it, we will grieve the Holy Spirit. We will quench the Spirit's moving in our lives. We will break fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will begin the process of spiritually dying. Think what happens when you break a branch. It's still soft. It's still pliable. But after a while, it dries up. It's dead. And it's only good for fire. Secondly, deceit. 1 Timothy 4.1 talks about doctrines of demons. One of the things we have to be very, very careful of today is the plethora of false teachings and false gospels that the enemy has laid out for everyone to get involved with. I think one of the worst things that, that's out in the world today is the number of self-help books that are out there that will help you achieve becoming the person that you want to be that have absolutely no spiritual basis at all. You know, it could be Oprah's top, I don't know if she has a top one, I know she, she recommends a lot of books and I am not say anything for or against, but we need to be very, very careful about the books we read and about the people that we allow to teach us and to speak into our lives. And you know, and, and, I, and I'm actually, may, may I say this, I'm actually surprised at the number of ministers who both read and promote books that come from a, a purely worldly perspective and, and, and thus are, are full of a, a, a perspective that will just lead you farther away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Lead you to look to self rather than to Jesus for your strength and for your deliverance. And the world is not going to present these as something evil, but as good. You might be wondering, well, how do I know then what to read? And then when, what not to read? I thank God that we don't live this life all by ourselves. That it, but if we're walking connected with the Holy Spirit, God has given us the gift of discernment, has he not? And when we see a book, 
even though it might look very, very attractive and promise and boast great things, the Spirit of God will rise up within our souls and say, don't touch that. Don't open that. Don't look at that. Because it has nothing to do with me. I mentioned this this morning. But I think it's important to mention again. Why, why is there, and I'll tell you why, it's just part of human nature. Why is there a fascination with that which is forbidden? Isn't that what got Eve into trouble all those years ago? There was that beautiful piece of fruit, good for food. And when Satan tempted her with it, he boasted great things about it. And even though she knew she wasn't supposed to eat of it, she did. Why? Because there's a fascination within the human... And I'm not saying that bad about her because we all share in this. There's a fascination within us, in our flesh, our old nature, with the forbidden. And there are a great many books and teachers, and we can call them gurus, I guess, who are out in the world today who promise great things. Oh, I know that Jesus, you know, all my sufficiency is him, but let me just see what he has to say. Don't do it. Stay away from it. If it's not Bible-based, Bible-infused, Spirit-inspired, it's not worth the paper it's printed on, and the only use that it has is to be burned up in fire. Like the lies of hell that it was conceived in. Let And, and if there's any question about it, any book... Um, and let me just give you the, this advice. And let me tell you, there, there are some books that come that I, I know that they're garbage. But I know if, if I'm going to speak out against them, I, I need to know what's in them. And some of them, I feel the permission to read. And what I mean by that, I know I can read it and God will protect me. And there's others I just feel I'd, I don't even want to read it. But I know the Holy Spirit, God has raised up individuals with a ministry to do that kind of thing. To investigate the book for me. So I can make a judgment based on, on his or her investigation of it. I don't have to read garbage. You know, I, don't, I don't have to eat garbage to see that it stinks and will make me sick. Somebody's already gone through the trouble of doing that. If there's a question about a book that you want to read, even if it's called Christian, find a, a godly man or woman or, or someone godly online who's actually taken the time to read it and to review it and see what they have to say. It's teachers, including those who expo expose error, they're gifts of God that God has given us Let's take advantage of them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Don't open your don't open your heart up to, to garbage. Break fellowship. Of course, there's demonic activity. Talked about that in First Timothy four. And the enemy is not just out there deceiving lies. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. And let me tell you, especially a year like this, he will do his best to get believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to get their eyes off of the blessings of God, which are yes and amen, and upon all of our trials and tribulations. And if you meditate on that stuff instead of meditating on whatsoever is pure and lovely of good report and praise, you'll grieve the Holy Spirit, you'll quench the Holy Spirit, and you'll put your connection with the Lord Jesus Christ in jeopardy which when broken leads to death. But lastly, let's get back to the rocky soil. The person who will not open up their heart to the Word of God and to the Spirit of God, to the presence of God, 
will surely fall. There are, there, there are people in sports known as bench warmers. They never play. They just kind of sit on the bench. And I'm not, if that was you, I don't mean... <laughs> listen, listen, as far as sports, I never even got to be a bench warmer. <laughs> I, never, I, knew, I, knew, I knew that's where I'd sit. I'd have plenty of splinters. So uh, I wasn't going to do it. But, um, but there are people, as far as their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, all it is is showing up on a Sunday morning for a couple hours, and that's it. They compart... I couldn't say it this morning. I still... Compartmentalized. Somebody say it for me. <laughs> Jim, I'm going to edit this out of the YouTube video. <laughs> I can do that. You know what I'm saying? They just kind of put Jesus in a box. I needed to write it out. That's what I didn't do. And uh, so I could read it phonetically. Um, and, and, and serving Jesus is just token service. It's just something you do for a couple hours. And the rest is just me. You will fail. And others even worse. And that's where... I was talking to Joe after the service. That's where, you know, the doctrine of one saved, all, always saved is, is, is just something deadly to the church. People have been told because you said a prayer at a youth camp or a revival service that you're going to heaven and God can't take it away from you. So you don't even, you don't even bother going to church. And you just go back out in the world and, you, and you're not changed. And the next thing you know, it's like, yeah, you know, Jesus. Yeah, I, I remember going to a service and I said a few words, so I'm okay. I fear for that person because someday they're going to stand before God. And God, to paraphrase Matthew chapter 7, Jesus, didn't I say a little prayer during a vacation Bible school? And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. They didn't take time to work on their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and stay connected to Him. Let me end by saying this, two things. Number one, how do we avoid getting separated? First thing, take your relationship with Jesus seriously. For this reason, we must pay, cl pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. All of us here, we take care of our bodies. You all look nice and clean. Eat well. Get rest. Some of us exercise. <laughs> you take a lot of time. In fact, the older you get, I hate to say it, the older you get, the more time you have to take in maintaining this vehicle that houses your human spirit. But you do it. Why do you do it? Because it's important to you. If you don't care, take care of your body, you'll have all kinds of physical problems, and we know people who have done that. How much more important is your eternal soul? You can take the best care of this body, but eventually it's going to die. Your soul lives forever. Do you take any time in caring for your body? That needs to be, your soul rather, that needs to be number one priority in your life. Number two, if you want to be fruitful, don't worry about making fruit. Just worry about staying connected. John 15, 4 and 5, once again. Remain in me, and I in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but must remain in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me, and I in him, bears much fruit from apart from me. You can do nothing. Staying connected to the Lord Jesus Christ is challenging, but it's not difficult. 
it's not a complicated set of rules that we need to do and rituals. We talked a little bit about that Thursday night. It's just by doing the base. It's nothing mind blowing here. It's just simply by doing the basis, spending time with God in prayer, spending time with God and on a daily basis. You need nutrients every day. Spending time in the Word of God. The Bible says Jesus was the Word made flesh. When you spend time in the Word, you're spending time with Jesus, connected to Jesus. Spending time in fellowship with other believers. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but you know, coming to God's house. But fellowshipping with other believers on a one-on-one -on -one basis and, and talking about Jesus. Encouraging one another in the faith. And then, and then lastly, service. If you love me, keep my commands. Tell others about Jesus. Help others. Love others. Pray for others. It's really simple. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's not hard. And if we do those things, we stay connected with the Lord Jesus Christ. More importantly, we will grow in Jesus and become fruitful in Jesus' precious holy name. Let's, let's stand together uh, this morning. And let's sing in closing uh, that chorus, The Heart of, of Worship. And may this coming year we recommit as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to maintain a strong connection with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Praise God.